Okay, we'll make a start. Hello, everyone. I hope you are all well and healthy. Uh, my name is Juan Viana. I'm an associate professor and researcher at the University of Mayan Portugal, where I lead a research group in exercise for kidney disease. And I'm also a member of the Global Renal Exercise Network Organizing Committee. And on its behalf, I would firstly like to welcome you all and thank you all for being here with us for this webinar or panel discussion entitled Exercise in Kidney Disease, Let's Start the Conversation. Of course, a warm welcoming and a special thanks to our, our panelists and our moderator, as well as to Emily for putting all this together. And before we start, I would like to highlight for those that are not so familiar with Grex uh, that we are a multidisciplinary an international group committed to make kidney patients more active and more healthy. And we have a lot of ongoing research and educational activities. So if interest, uh, please feel free to join us, follow our website, our social media. And uh, one particular project I would like to highlight today is the development of an exercise in CKD training program for fitness and health professions. Uh, the first edition of this course um, was released last year, uh, or the first version of the online models was released last year. We then gathered the feedback for the from the first people that took the course, and we had a meeting in last summer in Chicago where we gathered all that, that feedback and uh, reviewed the contents of the models. Uh, over the last few months, we have been busy uh, updating the contents and making all the necessary adjustments and recordings, and uh, the next version should be out pretty soon, so uh, look forward to it. And the next step is also to develop an internship practical hands-on experience for people to have the opportunity to learn and um, how to develop and, and implement an exercise programs in settings where this is already well established. So an opportunity for people to do some exchanges from country to country. So again, this will be developed uh, over the course, hopefully of the current year. Uh, but back to today and without further ado, I will pass the microphone to my colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Eitor Ribeiro. He is an exercise physiologist currently working as a postdoc uh, research fellow with the School of Medicine in the University of São Paulo in Brazil. And, and he will take you from here. Thanks, Eitor. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Joao, and especially Emily for hosting. Uh, the meeting. Uh, I'd like to introduce our speakers for our today's panel. So first, I'd like to start with Dr. Nausha Jangli, uh, who has worked as a consultant in acute medicine and nephrology in the South Wales, the UK, since 2016. He holds a long-standing interest in the acute effects of exercise upon renal physiology, and he was part of the working group who developed the first UK-based guidelines for the Renal Association on Exercise and Lifestyle in CKG. So welcome, Dr. Marshall, and thank you very much for joining us. You're free to, to say thank hi you. if you want. Hi, hi everyone. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So our next uh, speaker, and uh, it's Dr. Brad Tarka. Uh, he's a lecturer of clinical exercise physiology in the School of Allied Health and Human Performance at the University of South Australia, whose doctoral work focused on the influence of physical activity on physical function and symptom burden for people receiving peritoneal dialysis. Thank you very much, Brett. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning for you in Australia, right? <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, uh, one of our patient speakers will not be able to be here because we had a uh, blackout here in some neighborhoods in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, so we're supposed to have here Artur Neto, who is a kidney patient on dialysis for 16 years, creator and one of the hosts of the RenoCast, a podcast about chronic kidney disease. He works with Brazil's National Congress in search of more rights for chronic kidney disease. And it's a pity we don't have Arthur here with us, but we have another patient uh, from the UK, so Mad Warren. Uh, she has read on Nocturnal Horn hemodialysis for uh, 25 years since she was a teenager. 
She is a passionate campaigner and advocate in the kidney community, combining public speaking, advisory work, research involvement, and peer support, with a particular interest in harm dialysis, exercise, and the experience of young adults. She's a trustee of Kidney Care UK and a member of the NHS England Reno CRG. Thank you very much and welcome, Maddie. Thank you. Hi, everyone. <sighs> So, uh, for the next 30 minutes, uh, I'll be asking some really important questions for all these uh, incredible speakers. So, feel free to make questions for each one of you, or if you want to make comments on a previous comments. So, it's, it's a chat. So, we are now uh, able to talk and discuss all of the questions. Okay. Uh, so the panel's discussion will be focused on what conversations should healthcare providers be having with people living with CKD about exercises specifically. So my first question will be to Dr. Zhang Li. So Dr. Zhang Li, could you please uh, tell us what is CKD and what does it mean to have uh, chronic kidney disease? Could you explain and share your knowledge with us, please? Hi, Hector. Thank you for asking me that question. Um, it's an important question. I think I'd like to start by saying um, the, the the actual words chronic kidney disease do you mean you know do you instill fear in patients, especially the word chronic. Um, it can be interpreted in different ways, and I'd just like to mention as a clinician, chronic or you know as a as a healthcare, you know for a healthcare professional or even a researcher. Chronic means something long standing, but the connotations of chronic, you know, in a lot of people, public eye means something very severe, you know, nasty in a manner of, man of speaking. But chronic kidney disease, um, as a simple definition, is a long standing impairment in kidney function. And when we talk about kidney function, we typically talk about the blood test um, of, of a blood creatinine. Um, that's the main way that. The function of the kidney is is described certainly in clinical practice and in research practice, but also but um, specifically chronic kidney disease is essentially defined as an abnormality in the blood creatinine level that is higher than it should be, more than three months. It's sustained for more than three months. Um, that's the sort of key definition. If you look at lots lots of the international guidance, this is what they mention. Um, but there may be other abnormalities surrounding that that can be used to diagnose someone with chronic kidney disease. So, for example, you have a persistent abnormality in your urine. For example, there is blood or protein in the urine, and that's persistent. Even in the absence of a raised creatinine level, that's that can be defined as uh, chronic kidney disease. Or a scan abnormality, for example, like your kidneys may look small and shrunken, and sometimes that's picked up incidentally and be termed a, a chronic kidney disease. So there's different ways of defining it. But I go back to this blood creatinine level. That's the main way that we define it. Um, so for a patient to have chronic kidney disease, it's um, it's a surprise for a lot of patients. Certainly in the UK, it's something that's underdiagnosed and left maybe for a long time unnoticed when it sort of rears its head maybe the patient goes and sees their family doctor and then the family doctor's all oh, right yeah your blood creatinine level's been slightly abnormal for a long time so it can come to a sort of surprise to patients and some patients can have a mild impairment in their kidney function and others and this is not an uncommon situation we're telling them that they're on the verge of dialysis for the very first time to get a diagnosis of chronic kidney disease but they're told you know, you're going to approach dialysis soon. And that's a big shock to take in for a lot of patients. It's a, you know, when you talk about dialysis, it means a huge lifestyle change. Um, and, you know, it does bring a lot of fear because people think about the end or death if their kidneys stop working. But, you know, that that's clearly not the case. In you know, we've got wonderful dialysis modalities and also transplantation. Thank you very much for sharing uh, your knowledge and the definition and concept of chronic kidney disease and keeping on this theme I'd like to make a question for you Mary 
if you could share your experience as a person living with chronic kidney disease and all the aspects that Dr. Zhang Li discussed, and how has been your experience in terms of keeping active, physically active, and living with chronic kidney disease? Sure, thank you. Um, so I actually was a teenager when I went from being completely healthy, fine, very fit and active, just a normal 13 year old. And then I developed an autoimmune condition called FSGS, which is very aggressive. And within 18 months had completely destroyed my kidney function. So I started very fit, lost all my fitness, was very unwell, hospitalized, underwent a load of really aggressive treatments and then had my kidneys removed and started on dialysis. But because I was 13, I never knew that it wasn't the normal thing to try and stay fit and active on dialysis. And as soon as I could, I went back to school. I went back to sports lessons at school. My absolute massive motivation for getting home on PD and doing all my training was to get back to riding a horse, which was my passion at the time. So right at the very beginning, I just rebuilt my fitness on dialysis by going and doing sport and exercise. Um, and I guess I never really thought to ask whether I should be doing it, but it also didn't come from any healthcare professionals, particularly giving me advice either. Um, I, I sort of I sort of muddled through and rebuilt my energy and built fitness back into my normal dialysis regime, and that was that was fine. Um, and I did five years on PD all through school, just doing lots of normal fitness activities. And then I had an attempted transplant that was a complete disaster it never worked my fsgs returned immediately and my obviously my health the, the process of that transplant completely destroyed my health my fitness was back to ground zero um and i switched over to hemodialysis and i had to start all over again um which i did so at one point i could barely walk 100 meters down the road to like post a letter in the mailbox um and that was how badly my fitness had declined but I, I just felt that I'll walk a little bit more every day and then I'll walk a bit faster and then I'll run a little bit day and then I started going to the gym. I love dance. So I've, I've always kind of been a very active person. So again, I just took up all the normal activities that I enjoyed. Um, again, without really asking anyone whether I should be doing it or not, but that's always been my kind of approach throughout my entire dialysis experience is I just do things that feel right to me. And if it feels fine, I carry on. And if it doesn't, then I'll stop. Um, and I would say um, I've reached the point, I've been on dialysis 25 years now. I ran the London Marathon five years ago. I just completed a 100 mile endurance horse ride. Um, I am in the gym three times a week. I, I am really, really the fittest I've ever been. Um, I also lift weights a lot, which we can get into about how advice, the advice around not weightlifting and not going to the gym with a fistula, for example. It's very interesting to see the split now in some of the medical opinion about whether that's a good idea or not. Um, but I really have just, fitness is a completely equal strand in keeping me fit and well on dialysis as much as my dialysis treatment, my medication and everything else I need to do. The exercise is as important and it always has been for me. Um, and I think I would always say to people, it's not a linear journey. As we know with kidney disease, you can have bad and good times, your health can decline, you can have surgeries, you can have procedures that go wrong, you might have transplants and your fitness will fall back, but you can rebuild it. So you should never just see that as being, oh, that's it now. I'm just always going to be fatigued and unable to exercise. The body has an amazing ability to recover. But I think as part of our long term management of kidney disease, any type of movement and exercise and fitness is always going to help us feel much better. Good. That's amazing, Maddie. Thank you very much. So let's invite our exercise physiologists for the discussion as we've started discussing about the benefits and how exercise may promote uh, better health outcomes. So Brad, could you share, share us, what do you know about the benefits of exercise for people living with CKD, specifically dialysis, that has been your focus on your research? Thanks, hey, Todd. So uh, I don't have enough time to run through the list of all the benefits that we uh, someone can get uh, from being more active and engaging in exercise. Uh, and Maddie has really given a great first-hand account of the importance of it. So in the, trying to keep this kind of short, what we know from all the studies that have been done is that it can improve um, heart, lung, mental, muscle, joint health, uh, has a 
there's that famous saying that if it was a pill, you take it every day. It's the cheapest pill. Uh, this is really important as well because what we know, and particularly from Maddie's first-hand account, we know that uh, chronic kidney disease, and particularly dialysis, does have a uh, an impact uh, physical and physiologically and psychologically as well. So what we know from the studies out there is that exercise can help mitigate this. It's a strategy to help overcome this because what we want to see that um, translate to is these people still living their lives as much as they can. And what we know, again, from uh, all the studies that have been done, that when we are improving our heart, lung, mental, bone, muscle, joint health, this translates to being able to uh, maintain and do day-to-day -day activities. Uh, being able to mitigate the, the symptoms that can sometimes uh, occur because of um, CKD and dialysis. So specifically fatigue, shortness of breath uh, are two big ones that, that can be really uh, enhanced and, and, and mitigated through exercise. We know that sleep improves, which uh, can be a bit of a problem uh, for people who uh, are on peritoneal dialysis, for example. We see increased confidence. We see maintaining and increasing independence. Uh, the list really does go on. So uh, it's just so important to incorporate this as part of the management plan because we want to uh, not let the dialysis dictate the life. We want the person to be dictating their own life. And we know that people who are keep active are able to do this uh, a whole lot more. Right. Uh, you've mentioned uh, brilliant benefits and specifically the psychological aspect. So I'd like to make a question for Dr. Zhang Li. So what role, role do you think exercise plays in the quality of life of people living with CKD in your experience? Um, I, I, th I think it plays generally a, a very important role. Um, in patients on dialysis particularly, uh, you know, the majority of patients I come across on dialysis are in their older cohort. Um, and the, these individuals, they do... Um, have other sort of significant comorbidities as well um, and these significant comorbidities they can interact with the kidney disease to kind of promote things like fatigue and we know fatigue is a big symptom of chronic kidney disease and more so in patients who require dialysis um, and it's multifactorial in nature um, I think exercise routines, particularly for the elderly, can benefit their life uh, enormously because it, um, you know, the elderly patients they cough, they 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 often suffer from things like total isolation, and therefore participating in exercise routines in a group, for example, and we 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 have this in Cardiff, and you know help with social interaction, and as as you know as as has been mentioned already has great psychological benefits as well. Um, so that's one key example where, you know, quality of life can improve an awful lot um, through, through sort of a, a very targeted exercise program, you know, in a particular age group. Um, I find in my experience, the elderly patients are more motivated to, you know, to, to go down that route and they're more open to that. Unfortunately, individuals that I find of younger middle age groups that they're, they're less so, and I think that could be a, a result of issues where, um, you know, that you know, there are social issues at that age. You know, individuals are meant to be sort of working or bringing up families, and unfortunately, it's more challenging in that circumstance to try and introduce exercise and improve quality of life. But I must say, I, I have come across individuals. Not not as great as Maddie, but um, younger individuals who you know who are very motivated and even outside their dialysis sessions, they're keeping up some level of physical activity and it's clearly having benefits. And that's you can see that not only subjectively on you know how how they look, but also on their dialysis parameters. Um, and that's all really important because improving those quality of life parameters through physical exercise can also improve their chances of reaching landmarks like transplantation because you're, you're improving overall fitness especially in that younger age group um so yeah my experience of it at the moment is quite variable but as i mentioned a targeted approach can sometimes work really well particularly with the the old age group okay thank you very much we got a really important question and comment uh from the chat from charlie i guess uh, where he talked about 
how uh, his healthcare team probably has never discussed exercise and physical activity uh, properly with him during his treatment. So, Maddie, could you share us how was your experience with your healthcare providers and healthcare team when discussing physical activity and exercise? Yes, and hey, Charlie. Um, uh, so, the way it's always worked for me, I have an amazing relationship with my dialysis team. It's a very long term relationship. We're a real partnership as a team. However, it's always been me going to them saying, I'm going to do this. And then them either saying, well, we don't think you should do that or we don't care what you do, not in a bad way. Um, and to be honest, even when they say, well, we're not sure about that, which is very rare, I often don't really like always take that to heart because I know that medicine is evidence, data driven and evidence driven. And that's why Grex is fantastic because we're starting to publish data and guidelines and trying to be as evidence-based as we can. But the reality is there's an awful lot of stuff we don't really like, we don't have all the evidence yet with with exercise and kidney disease. And me personally, I'm, I'm a sort of try it and see person and my team are fully supportive of that. So for example, when I said I want to run the London Marathon, they said, we don't really have any experience of, of, of advising a dialysis patient to do that. So between us, we agreed I would try you know, trial and error, looking at my fluid, looking at my electrolyte intake, being sensible and see what worked and what didn't work. Um, and that was a fantastic approach. So it was very much with their support and endorsement. Um, but I wouldn't say that they have particularly ever given me any advice on, on exercise. And actually the question around weights is really common. It comes up an awful lot from people, particularly people on hemo with a fistula but or with a neckline. And um because I'm quite lucky to be quite well connected in the kidney world with lots of different clinicians, I've asked the question of some of the vascular access surgeons because the standard advice that has been given for the last 50 years is if you have a fistula, you should not lift anything. And, you know, people are told to not even lift a bag of shopping, for example, which starts to make your day to day life fairly impractical. Um, and and the surgeons who I've spoken to and asked this directly have said, actually, that's kind of outdated advice now, but it continues to be given to all the patients. So, you know, we need to update the advice that everybody is sharing, which is once a fistula is healed, and um, and this is straight from the surgeons, by the way, I'm not trying to make up medical advice, but once it's healed and is working fine and everybody's happy with it, you can go and start lifting low, low weight and then build it up and see how you feel. I mean, we're not turning people into bodybuilders here, but to, to be able to reach a reasonable amount of weight, which will give you the bone density improvements and the muscle strength improvements that we want to see, you can do that with a fistula, but everybody keeps telling patients you must not lift anything with a fistula. So, and I, I guess different countries, I don't know what the advice is, but that's certainly still the UK advice and people will very much take that to heart so i think we need to update all the all the evidence and all the new research that is being published needs to filter through to clinical practice so that people can answer those questions correctly and um there's a lot of you can't and i'm like well let's not worry about what you can't do can we please talk about exercises that you can so that here's all the things you absolutely can go and do you know whether that's walking or dancing or swimming or uh, rather than just cautioning people all the time to say oh you shouldn't do this you'd be worried about that um it's it's kind of it's kind of all quite fear driven and i feel like everybody's quite you know would rather say no than yes and it's that needs to sort of change because we patients are already tired and burdened and dealing with a lot of dialysis symptoms and all the rest of it they need encouragement and uh, the other part of it is i think your mental health and the mindset for exercise it's a chicken and egg, but you do need to be in a good mental state to probably feel able to start tackling some exercise, but also exercise, is, as, as Dr. Jungby said, is fantastic for your mental health. Um, so people, you know, renal psychologists play an important role in this too. You know, it's the whole team, it's the whole MBT sort of supporting the patient in, in trying to get active. And obviously there's lots of resources like Kidney Beam and things online now, um, which we never used to have. Um, but but and something I would say about weight training is that I obviously have had occasional bone density scans through my 25 years of dialyzing and I took up weight training seriously in 2018 and in 2022 I saw an 8% increase in my bone density just from weight training 
So I'm now well away from where I was, which is kind of borderline renal bone disease. So there's just another reason why the sort of therapeutic aspects of this are so powerful. But to answer your question about what, when does it come up in the conversation, in my experience, it doesn't. So pay, if you're on here and you are a patient, you have to ask the questions, push your team, challenge them if they are not helping you and tell them it is a fundamental part of your healthcare and you need their help. Um, so don't take no for an answer. Thank you. In my opinion, if we had uh, incorporated into the healthcare staff team, clinical exercise physiologists or physical therapists, we could uh, have this conversation from the very beginning from the treatment. And this is a question I want to make to you, Brett, as a clinical exercise physiology. Uh, if you had the opportunity or when you uh, have a talk with your patients, how does the conversation typically look like about exercise and physical activity? Thanks, Peter. Yes, uh, well, it really does depend on the person in front of you, so I'll try and keep this uh, a little bit sort of broad, but obviously we can talk about the benefits. I think uh, you can start at the, put that as a starting point, but actually the way that I've approached it in the past is uh, I actually want to understand the person themselves, understand where the barrier lies, uh, because no matter how much you talk about benefits of exercise, if that person has a negative opinion or has got people around them which are saying to them, don't do it, you shouldn't be doing it. Uh, and we've heard obviously from, from Maddie and from the, the comments in the, in, in the chat that uh, perhaps there is some uh, still some stigma around about exercising with a fistula or with a catheter, uh, which I think slowly the, the, the thinking is shifting uh, with regard to how clinicians feel about exercise for people, particularly on, on dialysis. So... So my probably tact is to, yes, talk about the benefits, talk about how it can help them, specific to people who are uh, living with CKD, but also try to understand, okay, so what's preventing you from doing this now? What, what, where's, where's your biggest barrier? Where's your biggest fear? And the ones that I typically uh, have heard historically is uh, a lot of it is to do with self-efficacy. It's the belief that they just, they just can't do it. It's too much reflection on uh, perhaps what they were able to do before they had um, CKD or before they were on dialysis. I used to be able to run. I used to be able to do uh, X, Y, and Z. Uh, so they're almost a little bit too busy living in the past uh, and they, they look at themselves now and they, they, they think that they can't do it. Uh, unfortunately, it's the a uh, little, little bit of the, uh, I want the results yesterday. They can't quite see it as the methodical process to getting back to a certain way. So my uh, approach has always been identify uh, where they think they're at and then working on it, building and showing them how we can progress that plan to get them back up to a point uh, where they start to obviously feel a lot more happy about themselves and trying to take away, as I said, that negative where they keep on referring back to, I used to be able to do this and try and then looking at themselves now and the gap between what someone used to do, I used to be able to do a lot more 10 years ago as well. Uh, I think we all can probably say that uh, and unfortunately, age catches up with us, uh, irrespective of uh, of CKD. Uh, so there is that obviously realization that okay, we're not spring chickens anymore. But does not mean that we can't actually get you up to a point that makes you feel as though you did ten years ago. So my approach, just to kind of summarize that, is to yes, talk about the benefits specific to them, but also start to identify okay, where are these barriers lying? Is it self efficacy? Is it safety? Uh, are we thinking that it, uh, is there too much negative messaging around safety? Well, everything that the literature tells us, and particularly some of the perceptions that clinicians are starting to hold, is that it is safe uh, from everything that we know and that we should be incorporating it into the management plans. Of course, there's still a long way to go until it's seen as a, a uniform uh, exercise being a part of the treatment care plan, uh, but, it's a, but it is slowly getting there. And obviously, with a uh, with group like Gretz uh, and the research that uh, we're doing, uh, hopefully we're going to see that bridge uh, quote, um, crossed out much sooner rather than later. Hey, thank you very much, Dr. Brett. Uh, one comment that you, you did was about the safety and some of the barriers that most of the patients they may face when starting exercise. And we have a question from the shot that probably you could help us uh, to enlighten this, this question, Dr. Jambli, which is a common uh, worry about uh, some patients, specifically uh, pre-dialysis patients, about the effects of exercise on creatinine. And this may be associated with muscle mass and increasing muscle mass may increase creatinine. So could you 
share us uh, your knowledge and explain us this association. And mm -hmm. if you may respond to our patient, Edward, if yes. he should be worried about his creatinine when exercising. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. Th thank you. Thank you. Um, so, yes, to, to Edward. Yeah. Um, so the one thing to mention to mention about creatinine, it's 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 a proxy of kidney function. So it's nothing to do with the kidneys, you, you know, in a general sense. But we use it as a marker of how well the kidneys are working or not. And as you know, creatinine is generated from muscle metabolism. So when you exercise your muscles and, you, and it happens to even normal people, you can have an acute rise in creatinine. It's very temporary. But if you happen to measure it, maybe two or three hours after intense exercise, that creatinine level can go up. And GFR, you know, estimated GFR is a mathematical equation. And if you plug that into an eGFR, it will look like it's apparently low. And that can be all oh, my kidney function is reduced. But um, it's not. It's a normal physiological um, uh, a normal physiological response to exercise and after a day or so at the very most that creatinine level will actually normalize um, and that's because exercise causes reductions in kidney blood flow because the rest you know a lot of your blood is actually going to the working muscles so to 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 to, to, to then focus on edward's concern here I, I wouldn't be concerned really i would you know exercise your gfr you know, EGFR, if it happens to be measured just after exercise and it goes up, that could be an effect of exercise. I mean, there are other, it doesn't mean that your kidney function is getting worse at all. Um, and the important thing to look at is it's the trends over time. So if they're in very mild fluctuations, say over a year in a patient who has an EGFR between 13 to 15 or, you know, or a bit lower than that, it, you know, that's quite stable TKD. That's not a major deterioration. Um, and at that level of a uh, thirteen percent kidney function, you know your, your your clinician will be looking at other symptoms um, that may be suggestive that your kidney function is not keeping you well. So, you know, for example, if you're going four times to the, you know, to the gym a week, you must be quite healthy to do that with an EGFR thirteen, in my experience. So, it's unlikely you're, you're getting significant fatigue or not eating and drinking and vomiting or having very poor sleep. You know, those are markers of, you, you know, that we associate as clinicians of, of end-stage renal disease. So, yeah, my general opinion based on that information that's been given from Edward, I wouldn't be worried at all. Okay, thank you very much. So let's move uh, with another question to, to Maddie as we've been discussing about barriers and some concerns that people may have about exercise and its safety. And you've been brilliantly working as uh, an exercise passioner, especially in your Instagram and Twitter accounts, motivating uh, people on exercise brilliantly. So could you share us a little bit uh, what you as a patient or other patients may may do to advocate exercise uh, for themselves yes and i think well interestingly i suppose my my early experiences of dialysis and kidney disease there was no social media we had far less connectivity between the patient community so this information was not flowing around and and while social media has many bad sides that is very powerful because we know that role models and peer support is huge when people want to learn what it's really like living with a condition that you know so it, you can ask your your doctor or your nurse lots of questions but the real lived experience is 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 really truly important too because um those are the people who've tried and sort of tried and failed or tried and succeeded at doing various things so i do i do use social media as a tool to just show what's possible now i am fully totally accepting not everybody wants to push it to an extreme the way I choose to and that is a choice and it's not going to be suitable for everybody to try that either but I guess I took the view that if I show how extreme you can get to in some exceptions and that that is partly to do with the fact that I also do nocturnal home dialysis so I do a lot of hours of dialysis very slowly and gently through the week that's not what this conversation is about but 
that is a big reason why I am so fit and well. So also your dialysis modality and the dialysis you choose is important if you want to be fit and well. But um, I choose to kind of push it to an extreme to show people that even if you don't go that far, um, there is a lot you can still do at whatever level you wish um, to, to, to raise your fitness levels. And I think we, we need to talk about it in terms of um, quality of life. We need to talk about it in terms of being fit and well and prepared for transplant because I'm personally not waiting for a transplant. So I just have to get on with life as it is. But I notice a lot of people who are on the waiting list take a sort of stance of like, now I'm waiting for a transplant and my life will stop until I get my transplant and then I'll restart my life. And that is really not the way to think about it. You want to be pursuing everything you can now and especially staying fit and healthy. So you are as fit and primed for transplant. So when it comes, your recovery will be easier. Everything will be better. So I would really encourage patients to, to self-advocate as in don't, don't give up however exhausting it feels and however much you feel like you're just dealing with a lot of the burdens of dialysis. And we know there are lots of burdens of dialysis, but exercise typically is a positive some game you know you, you put a bit of effort in and you'll get a bit of benefit out and then you can just gradually um increase that do something you love as well like don't go if you hate swimming don't go swimming like do what do something you're going to actively want to go out and do and i can't i mean walking is amazing um just getting out walking and getting that fresh air as well but in terms of advocating within the clinical team i think like i said before you may well find that when you ask the questions your clinical team don't have the answers and like sometimes in dialysis you sort of just have to say okay well if we don't have answers i'm going to go and learn, learn for myself it's great to have grex do point your clinical team towards the grex resources if they're not aware of it and you know go find the papers on exercise bring them into your clinic appointments show the evidence that is there to your team and and so rather than it being a sort of you asking them for advice and then saying sorry we can't give you any advice and that's the end of the conversation go away and do the research and, and, and reopen the conversation um, and get on the you get on the patient support groups, ask other people, ask other people in dialysis what they're doing, what works well. Um, and, and I promise everybody can do something um, and something is brilliant rather than nothing. So even if it's just a short walk and you think, oh, that wasn't really doing me much good, it really will. And if you do it again the next day, even more so, and you'll be amazed how incrementally your fitness improves and you feel like you might be able to tackle more but you don't have to climb Everest in a day so you know set small goals that feel achievable and then you can reward yourself and feel positive about exercise rather than just feeling like you're exhausted and you've taken on too much because that will backfire um and I, like I said when I was at my worst I could barely walk down the road I could barely walk up a flight of stairs but then I got back to being able to run a marathon so the power of recovery is phenomenal and, and trust your body it, it will respond well bodies enjoy exercise on the whole that's brilliant maddie uh right uh, one of the the main barriers we have uh when engaging and helping patients to get engaged in exercise and physical activity is because we don't have exercise professionals involved in most of the renal care units so what uh, knowledge and advices you would like to share with the healthcare providers on how they could encourage patients to be physically more active? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And obviously uh, this is a, the question really depends on the model of care, I guess, in respective countries. And I can only speak from an Australian point of view and you are correct. There aren't exercise professionals in our renal services uh, and it always winds me up. Uh, and it's something that we're always trying to work towards here. And I'm sure obviously globally as well. So in the meantime, we have to create strategies, obviously, to make sure that our clinicians are understanding what's going on. Uh, so there's a few things we can do, obviously. Uh, Maddie is, is answering all my questions, basically, uh, through her own journey. And a lot of what she says is very much uh, what, what, what I would probably say. And it's being proactive, obviously. Uh, we need to, I think we need to first have a almost a global uh, on the same page, that exercise has to be part of the of the of the of the management of CKT. I don't think we're quite there. I think everyone knows. We all. I think everyone says, okay, you know, we should be active. We we should be doing exercise. We can be doing this. All the patients should be doing this. But we actually don't know what that means. So it comes back to education, and it comes back to informing clinicians. Okay, this is what they can do. This is some generic advice. 
this is some generic considerations. Obviously, they're not going to apply to all, but I think it's just where we're at right now because we don't have those professionals in clinics to give that very unique, tailored, very specific response to a certain person. So it comes back to education. It comes back to knowing the benefits. It comes back to talking about the safety. It comes back to overcoming some of those common barriers that, um, that patients might present with. And I think most importantly, because we don't have exercise professionals uh, as a um, standard member in a team, it's about knowing that particularly uh, nephrologists, and this is my own experience, um, what they say is so important because a lot of the patients, they really trust the nephrologist, they trust the consultant. And even if we did have an exercise professional, there's actually a chance they would listen to me anyway uh, because I don't have that relationship with them. So I think that we have to um, really uh, embed nephrologists and consultants and renal nurses for that matter because they spend a lot of time uh, with patients with the knowledge and to know that when they actually speak and when they are actually encouraging people that it's it's like gold, uh, particularly here. Um, throughout my entire research, um, I was basically an external researcher. Um, but, and so when I'm trying to recruit people to do exercise, uh, got a few blank looks. As soon as it came out of the nurse's mouth, oh, it was gold. Uh, it was, okay, I can do it. Uh, so it really showed that power of the healthcare providers, some of those main healthcare providers and the influence that they can have. So I think it's about really trying to, to get the education out there, get the clinicians knowing what can they do. I know it's not their specific role, but I think, as I mentioned before, we're a little bit of a way off before having exercise and professionals embedded in a model of care within a renal unit. So we have to create a strategy in the meantime. And I think that centers around what can they do. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Brett. Uh, so I'd like to, to make a last question uh, for all of you. So if you could share us some thoughts, uh, two, three minute thoughts about what uh, we need or what we should change in order to provide and to reach people living with CKG to, to have more exercise, a healthier lifestyle. So I'd like to to hear from your perspective, Maddie, and then from your perspective, uh, Dr. Jangli, and then from you, Brett, as an exercise physiologist. Um, I have, oh, well, I was, I've just noticed Stephanie's comment, Dr. Thompson's comment in the chat as well, which is, we should see exercise oh, as part sorry. of our treatment. Yeah. Our treatment. No, no, I, I, I totally agree though. It, it's, it's, it should be seen as part of our treatment and therapeutic approach. Um, and I would love to see it sort of embedded in treatment protocols, guidelines, specifications, whatever your country has in regard to renal care. Exercise should be a, a section within that. So it's completely embedded in the same way you look at how you prescribe dialysis or what medication you're giving. Because um, I notice in other specialties, so I had a family member who had a heart attack and was then immediately referred to an entire cardiac rehab program, a free gym membership, supervised PC sessions, all as part of the cardiac rehab well why don't we have that in kidney disease you know rehab or what the beginning of your you know diagnosis whenever it is in the journey i don't understand why that's seen as important in heart attacks and not in kidney disease so certainly that's in the uk anyway it would be really nice to see that replicated in ckd so people have the support because it's hard to do this on your own um you need some structure you need some advice so having an exercise professional working with you would be absolutely amazing but i appreciate that's not always possible for people so but as much as we can embed it to be normalized, that would be a real positive step. Dr. John Lee, what should nephrologists be doing differently to help people living with CKG to, to be more active? Um, I, I think the most important thing for me is time. Um, and nephrologists needs to find the time with the patient in the right setting to discuss these things. In my experience, certainly within our healthcare setting, it's getting more and more busier. So we're having patients with, you know, who are more complicated, have got lots of other issues outside their medical problems. And sometimes the consultations we have and the sort of precious time we have with patients is spent dealing with other problems sometimes and firefighting. So I think that my my sort of starting point for nephrologists and other healthcare professionals is just to find dedicated time, maybe even part of a consultation, maybe five or ten minutes, just to you know start the conversation. 
you know, do you have any interest? Do you like doing exercise? And then it's it's really small steps. It's baby steps. That's where, the, for me, most of the benefit can be realised and sort of building that up gradually and not going with a sort of heavy approach. Let's say, yeah, let's hit the gym, you know, four times a week immediately. You know, you know, that's, you know, I think patients would be destined to fail if they approach it in that way. But it's just finding that time to have that conversation. For me, that's something that's really important. And for me, my time is just split everywhere <laughs> throughout the working week. And finding just a bit of time to discuss these things aside, maybe making one consultation part of, you know, looking at lifestyle change, you know, I think is really important. Sharing uh, your thoughts, Dr. Jungley. Um, let's just sense, Brett, as an exercise physiologist, specifically when we think on fitness centers and gyms and etc. Some patients may feel uncomfortable to go into these places. So, what should we, exercise physiologists, be doing differently to engage and to encourage people living with CKD to be more physically active? Yeah, it's a great question, uh, and I think. Uh, Stephanie actually really approached it well. It's to normalise it. Uh, it's to not think of it as a, a sort of a glamorous billboard type uh, thing that we have what we need to do. I think we just need to standardise it within the actual treatment plan for people uh, who live with CKD. Uh, that would be the first thing uh, I would personally uh, like to approach it and take the stigma out of it. Uh, when we think of exercise, I, also, I often like to answer, ask that question to a patient. What do you think exercise means? And they might refer to something like the biggest loser. Uh, where they've seen it on TV and someone's getting um, flogged for two hours. And that's not great. No one likes that. Or oh, you might if you do. Good for you. Um, but uh, for people who obviously are not quite well, uh, they're going to think, oh, I don't want that. So I think it's about actually educating what does exercise look like? What does physical activity look like? Um, I often like to tell um, the patients here, yeah, physical activity can be cleaning the house, which some of them screw their nose up at, which is probably something that they don't want to do. But it's activity and it's movement. Uh, so it's taking away that sort of stigma that, okay, exercise is uh, running. Uh, so Maddie's the exception. She likes to do those really, really tough things. And I absolutely love that. Um, but uh, it's just not for everyone, as I'm sure, as she's, as she's pointed out. Uh, but taking away that, okay, exercise means running for an hour. Exercise means uh, lifting as heavy as you can and doing these big grunts while you're doing these maximal lifts. It is not that. It is what you want it to be, as long as it is movement. Uh, as long as it is doing what you like. That's why when I talk about health promotion, I very rarely talk about what the prescription looks like because it's always going to be based around the things that they like. So I find that the easy part. Uh, it's getting to that point that actually getting them to do it is uh, sometimes the, the, uh, the challenging part, which is why I like to focus on that. Uh, so I think we need to normalise it as being part of everyday life, a part of being the treatment plan. Um, and obviously we need to get... and. and uh, in terms of getting exercise professionals, in the absence of exercise professionals in an actual uh, renal team, I think if we, uh, I, we, there's two things we can do. We have to obviously educate the clinicians to make sure that they can provide some, uh, some advice or at least have a referral pathway there in place. What does that look like? So being able to ally up with perhaps external providers, I understand it's not uh, perhaps the most desirable thing when you have to have um, referring people externally. But if there is a pathway there, a model of care where, okay, we have some uh, some resources, we have some people out there who we know we can uh, partner with who can provide this advice, I think that's a great um, intermediate step um, before we can actually get exercise professionals into clinics full-time. Brad, for sharing your knowledge and thoughts as a clinical exercise physiology. So I'd like to thank uh, all you three for giving us your insights and feedback and experiences and sharing your knowledge with our audience. So it's been a very nice 30, 35 minute conversation. And I'm sure we all learned a lot uh, from you today. And to finish our webinar, I'd like to invite Dr. Stephanie Thompson to give us some thoughts and discussions about the next steps for exercise, CKD, and lifestyle promotion. Thank you, Thank Steph. you, Peter. It's been a pleasure listening. Uh, similar to Dr. Jung Lee, I'm a nephrologist, in, but I'm in Canada. And I really appreciated hearing today everyone's point of view. Um, we heard about the benefits from Brett 
in particular, how relevant exercise is to people with kidney disease, um, that it can help improve and preserve physical function and also address many of the symptoms that are specific to people with kidney disease, like fatigue and depression and other things like restless legs. And we've heard inspirational stories. Um, and uh, thank you, Maddie, for sharing those. It's wonderful to hear about, about how you can live um, an active life and manage your dialysis as well. I think on an individual level, um, for future steps, what I would hope is that, you know, as people living with kidney disease, that you still continue to go to your kidney providers and ask about exercise and express the interest in becoming more active, because I also think that there is a, you know, not a true, not a true belief among providers sometimes that we think that people aren't interested. And so that type of pull and that, and that vocalization of that desire to be more active is really important for changing the culture. And also that if you are told no, or you're given advice that doesn't sound quite right, that it doesn't stop there, that you seek out other professionals. And that is part of our role with Brex is to help you connect you to the literature, um, to other people in other parts of the world who are actually doing things, i.e. exercising with fistulas and lines um, that can help you give other advice. We tend to be quite conservative in medicine. Um, and so if we don't know, we either there's variability or um, we just say, don't do it because that just seems like the safest, but it actually in the long term isn't. So I think that that's what I would think of as a future step as we go forward is trying to change the culture um, and creating that pull from the patient side. It's a powerful voice. All right, and that concludes our 2024 Grex webinar. I'd like to thank all of our presenters today and everyone who was able to make it out to this panel discussion. I wish everyone a lovely 2024. Uh, and just a heads up here, we will be uh, uploading the recording of this panel discussion to our YouTube channel. So please uh, check it out later on our Twitter account. Take care, everyone. Thanks again.